become more responsive to netted pipeline. That's one thing we'll look at. So you might be more used to have a lot, lot of modeling. This is very reduced form type. Uh, I do have the data for the modeling. I just have not yet done it. But I have really, really cool data of the transit app, urgent destination, of millions of trips. So uh, if there are one of you wants you, just letting that out there. Um, so when we think about bike line, why does it matter to look at that? You know, there's so many great climate policies. You can think of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's billions of dollars in the economy. But there's a thing which is the most expensive land in Americas are now getting more and more transformed into bike lane. So we should just know, does it work? First question. And if so, you know, what's the proportion that it does? And who benefits from it? Okay. So long story short, bikes are great. This is an example of me going to play golf. Um, I can either take a subway, which is a very complex trip, so I need to take a bus, take the line, takes, uh, according to transit app, around uh, an hour 10, or 46 minutes, depending which one I get. If I buy to the subway station, for example, I could get there in 34 minutes. So I can save 10 to 30 minutes only by biking to the subway station, which is great. That's why you can use your bike. The other thing, you can think about short trips. Here's another example, orange snake and latte. If I go to subway, it's 40 minutes. If I walk, it's 46. If I bike, it's 13. And even if I take a car, it's 11. And you know, since Florida is a lot of no more parking, it's kind of harder. So for a long, complex trip, those that you kind of have two nuts, per se, bikes can be great. For those that are short, Bikes, again, can be great. But the other question is, why are people not biking? And my take on it is that uh, it's scary to bike if you don't have bike lane. It's the main element. So if you have a bike lane, you see people actually start to change, or just people that bike live in the rub and love it when they live in Copenhagen. Uh, I will mostly focus on Montreal today. And the reason of it is because Montreal is a Beautiful event study. They are quite as radical for American city in terms of bike lanes. Lately, they added mm, a numerous number of protected bike lanes. They transformed street into protected bike lane, making it very neat to analyze them. Here's an example of a bike lane that they built. It's just massive. This is city downtown. Imagine King Street having this. This is what this is. This is on Baby. This is massive, okay? So there's a lot of these bike lanes. In red, it's what we call the Express Biking Network. You can think about bike highways, what England have. So these are, you should think about that as highways more than like a boulevard. So the idea is to connect neighborhoods between them. So in the red is what has been built from 2019 to 2022. Today we'll focus on one and five, uh, because they had data before and after the treatment period. Uh, in black is what is planned in the next few years, so and they have a half a billion dollar invested in the bike lane in the next decade, so it's a massive investment Montreal is doing on. So you should really evaluate if it works. The other great thing about Montreal is it has all the bike's main counter-argument. It's winter and hilly. So if you can make people bike with another bike lane in Montreal, yes, they will bike in other city as well. So that, that's why, for example, looking at Paris or England, it's probably not as such a great counterfactual for Boston, New York, whereas Montreal is a great one, because in all aspects, it's worse. Like even Montreal is way worse than Toronto in many regards. Because um, it's hilly and worse winter. Another thing is that uh, this is the bike share data, the brightest shit that's been soaring massively. You can look at uh, 2014, was around 2.5 million, and 2023, it's around 11 million. So this is a trend that is common all over the US. If you put, if you put Montreal, I think it's still ranked among the first or the second, in all of the American cities that has highest increase of bike share, right? New York being very high, they have been great policy in New York too. So in terms of data, how can I insert this question? This is actually three sets of data that really help with it. The first is have origin destination of each 
by a share station. Okay, so for every trip, so that was L for the 100 million trips that we have out there, I know the origin and the destination at the very second close of what it was. So you have extremely rich information that are public data. Toronto has the same data out there. There's two things you can, you can see from this pictures. It's the evolution of the network across years, each dot for a bike share station, and the color is the ridership, the annual ridership of this specific bike share station. So what you can see is that initially, the bike share network was really concentrated in the middle and started to expand outbound. This will be crucial for the first exploratory analysis that we'll be doing, because that will help us to understand that once you had bike share or bike lanes to an area, how is the ridership in change? Other thing you see is there's a higher increase in ridership, especially you know, 2019, 2022, see it a lot. I've not yet updated 2023 uh, on all my graph, so that'll be a thing. And the, key, the thing that is crucial is the bike lane data. So I can know every bike lane, which year they got built, and what is the quality of the bike lane. I can also know if this bike lane has been upgraded. So, in blue is all the protected bike lane. I use their definition of the city, protected being something that protects you from the street. Uh, so paint is not protected, will be unprotected. Bike shadow, which is just like arrows, this is not my data set, this is no bike lane. Okay, so you can think about Spadina as having no bike lane, Bloor as having unprotected bike lane on one side, protected on the other side. We also see that here, all of that been implemented. Okay. That's very rich data. Everyone's good with that? Um, also, a back scanner to verify my data. We'll not do that today. So first thing in the analysis I'll be doing is the very most intuitive thing. Here's a screenshot of what the bike share network looked like. In pale blue is unprotected bike lane, and dark blue are protected bike lane. So what I can do with it is to identify the, dis the differentiation between protected of protected both or not. So by doing so, we'll be able to fear how a bike lane would impact the bike share ridership. Okay. So here's an example. This one would be a protected bike lane. So in the matrix, it's a dummy one for protected, zero for the rest. In this case, it's a dummy one for unprotected, but it's not protected in this. Uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 meters radius around it. This one has boat, which is great, and it's really important to have boat because a lot have boat, do you want to distinguish what's the impact of boat? And this one has none. So all of that is around the same neighborhood. So in order to identify that, what I will also add is sensor track and destination area fixed effect. Okay. So here's what I will do. I'll do a two-way uh, two fixed effect. So, are, are you familiar with two-way fixed effect? Yeah, no? You have a board? Um, essentially, the idea of a two-way fixed effect is you can think about a treated group, and we have this the background assumption that the untreated group will have the same trend afterward. And that the difference will be captured, the difference between the treated and the untreated for a specific area will be captured by the alpha, which is the fixed effect. So you can think about downtown Toronto as a high ridership, okay? So if you make a fixed effect, all the bike share stations in downtown Toronto have a high ridership because they're set in this area. So then it will look within this particular neighborhood, the difference between the protected and unprotected. So that's what we call identification. So the idea is to isolate with the role protected and unprotected, but the location is a massive issue. Because indeed, the downtown will have a higher ridership. The other thing is time, you might have just a trend upward. So that's what we call two-way fixed effect. Is you have a fixed effect for every time period, for example, year. And you have another fixed effect for the location. So that way you capture the two dimensions that can affect the impact. So then you will minimize the square error with protected and unprotected will help us to infer what's the role of the device. Are you all familiar? Do you all follow me in it? Maybe that's, you know, it's probably the, the idea is, you know, we share each other. I'm pretty sure a lot of things in internet are going to understand. So uh, if 
If you learned that, I think it's great. Uh, tools. Good? So a good way to look at that is also a bike share kilometer square. So you can think about, you know, St. George campus is a place where there's good, good amount of ridership. So there's likely to have a lot of bike share in this specific area. So if the fixed effect capture well the endogeneity of the location, okay, this coefficient should be negative because there's competition. You can think about if we had the 100 bike share station on St. George Street, the number of bike share within this area will finally compete with each other. Okay? But if my fixed effect is not good, then we will put a lot of bike share in this area because it's a good area to bike. Okay? So you can look at St. George, there's like five bike share stations in the street, which is a lot. But once you calculate the fixed effect of a specific location, then we know this area always have a lot of bike share. Okay? So if this sign is positive, it means we do a poor job. If it's a negative, it means we don't do a poor job. I'm not saying it's a good job, <laughs> just saying it's not a poor job. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, so here at the bottom is number of stations per square per kilometer square. So how many bike share stations is it within one kilometer square? And this is the data with fear to know that. So when we have no fixed effect, we find that this coefficient is around four, meaning every time I add a bike share station, I increase the ridership, which is kind of unintuitive because they should compete each other. When I look at the central track fixed effect around a kilometer square, we see a negative sign, and when we look even smaller, so it's a thing that is a subset of this central track, it's, uh, you know, 100, 200, 400 kilometers square, it's very small, then we again find that, okay? The great thing about it is we clearly see that um, the, the impact of the bike lane decay with distance. So what we find, yes? Why don't you just have density directly as a variable in your model? Why don't you have a fixed effect for the census tract? If the census tract fixed effect is mostly trying to capture density. No, it's, it's not trying to capture density. It's, it's a validation point more than... Okay. The idea is to capture the impact on ridership. Yeah. As you can see here, uh, you know, here's points 27 versus here's 16 and here's 20, mm -hmm. right? So since I don't capture the endogeneity of the location, I in fear the bike lane has more impact than they truly have. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the bike lane that actually create an impact, it's just this neighborhood is great to bike. Mm -hmm. For a reason that, you know, it's not a bike lane. You can think about low traffic, neighborhood area. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that's why the fixed effect is there. And that was more of a validation point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good. The other thing is great is you clearly see a decay with distance. So the first 100 meters has higher impact on ridership. The second has a bit less. The, the third has more have no impact on ridership. So clearly, when you think of a bike lane, we show up that. Third thing we're seeing is that clearly protected bike lane has higher impact on ridership than unprotected, around two times more. Okay. So, so far what we did is pretty basic stuff. We took all the bike share stations in Montreal. We looked at what's the ridership of each of them. We said, are you near a bike lane? If yes, you have a dummy, it is a one. And also to control the fact that these locations are endogenous, you don't you don't put bike share to shift places, right? We have a fixed effect for the location, and that we find that bike share decay with distance and two times more impact on protected bike. Lane. So quality does matter. It's kind of pretty important. The main issue of that education strategy is that my control group here is far from perfect. The bike the bike share that does not have bike lane are unlikely to be literally identical to the B or unlikely to be very comparable to the protected one, okay? Uh, so it's, you can think about certain neighborhood that just not having bike, uh, bike share without protected bike lane. And you can probably start to put the bike share station in residential area where there's no bike lane. So this is an issue on it, and that's what it's more common to do what we call an event study uh, in economics. So we'll really carefully look at some treatment, so some specific treat, street that received uh, treatment, and some specific treat that is a control that didn't receive the treatment, okay? 
So that way we can really have a control group that we know is unaffected and is comparable to the treatment group. So now we can vary in fear what is the difference between the control and the treated area. So here's what I have as control treatment. So the treatment will be uh, Saint Denis and Belle Chasse. Lighting is, yeah. I lost my slide, it's just the board. And I'm not sure you can read. So, yeah, so the, the treatment is Saint Denis and Belle Chasse in red here. And the control with basal nerve. I'm going to show you some picture in a few seconds. This is very important as a element. Uh, and here, there's a mountain dividing them. So it's very unlikely someone bike here and do that, because you just cannot, there's the Mont Royal, which is there, okay? So they, both of them actually converge on the city downtown, which in certain way will be an issue in my paper, because the event is mostly 2020 onward. Uh, so we'll do some analysis to put that aside. But the fact that they're both affected by the pandemic helps to identify it. Because I, I look at the, all the treatment increase relative to the control group. Okay. Here's what the treatment that Shas used to look like. So, quite a lovely street. It's a two way cars, there's some place for the bikes. And what's it look like after? So, they're very, very narrow for the cars. That has been shown that it's it slowed down the speed of people. Very well protected bike lane. And that's an elementary school, so it's probably a good idea to do that from a welfare perspective. Uh, but this doesn't really increase ridership, that's a question. The other one is Saint Denis, so that's a quite an ugly street there. Uh, you know, it's two ways of car each side plus one way of parking each side. And what they did is they changed it to, well, you don't have the picture now, but uh, yeah, I lost it. <laughs> uh, it looked uh, pretty neat with some clean bike line there. I don't know why we don't have it, it's annoying. Let me show you. I have it on my computer. I don't. Probably delete it. So yeah, they just change it so it's only one way, uh, one car each side, and there's a clean parking on each side. Okay. And here's the control. So that's Maison Neuve. That's the former type of making bike lane. They were making a bike lane that is two ways on the side. Um, and here's the path which is an area that was not built, but was considered instead of saving. So this is the two control I will use to infer all the bike lane back ridership. The problem with Maison Neuve is likely that affected differently by the pandemic, Whereas, for example, the working from home, which is an issue. When you think about back avenues, the problem it has is it is literally just beside uh, Saint Denis bike lane, so it is likely to have benefit from some spillover effect. So it is not fully independent. So these two treatments are, are like kind of unperfect. Yes. When you say benefits, because like people who say like, okay, I will go to Saint Denis bike lane because it's safer than uh, cars. Yes. So I think we have to look at all. What's my source of data? Okay. It's not pass through. It's people taking a bike share or dropping a bike share, and it is likely that within the radius of pack, you will bike your bike share just that, okay. just there. So I actually evaluate that slightly further. Uh, you know, the other bike lane, are they competing with existing bike lane? I actually find that no, there's positive spillover effect on them. Uh, which I was quite surprised, uh, so I'll show you that later. So here's some summary statistics to show that, you know, these two neighborhoods are very similar. They also benefit from the same change in infrastructure. You can see the number of bike share per thousand of people around pretty much the same amount of places. Okay. So the treatment is not completely different from the control. The way they manage a control treatment, the bike, it's pretty much similar. Okay. So the idea is to isolate this new bike lane on ridership. So how do I do that? Again, I do a two-way fit, I do a different diff using a two-way uh, fixed effect. We're very similar. The only difference is here my treatment will be one if you're in a treated zone. So I will look at here's my bike lane, and in a buffer of 200 meter. Are you, are you within a buffer of 200 meter of the bike lane? If so, then you're treated. I'll do the same with the control. Are you in the buffer of 200 meter? If so, then you're controlled. And do the same with 500 meter. Okay. So I have two different buffer of distance. And I will have the same thing again. Treatment, the bike share. that will capture the competition of the, the really nearby bike share. The alpha that will capture the, 
you know, the quality of the neighborhood and the time fixed effect, which will capture, you know, part of the pandemic effect, for example. Okay. So to resolve, what we find is that bike lane clearly increased distance. We can see that within the first 200 meter, for, uh, you know, both that are joined together, we see around the 20, yeah, we're around 30% increase of uh, bike ridership in the treated area relative to the control for the buffer of 200 meter. And you can see that it's around 20% for the 500 meter. So clearly the new other bike lane increased the ridership in the treated area relative to the control and it decay with distance, which is fairly intuitive as we shown earlier, that's what we should have expected. The difference is different. Uh, the, the impact is heterogeneous across the bike lanes. And the reason of that is, you know, Saint Denis was already very big before they had a bike lane. It was a big street, a lot of people bike despite the poor quality of it. Belshaz was like more remote street, not that many people were biking in it. And also, Belshaz benefits from Belshaz itself and Saint Denis because Saint Denis can connect the rest east west. Whereas Saint Denis don't really benefit from Belshaz being built. Right. So one is like the highways and the other is like the boulevard. You can think about that. Okay. So indeed, this one is uh, bigger for two reasons, smaller, and benefit from two bike lanes from just one. And you will see that slide later on in a magazine. Another thing that, I don't know if, have you ever seen an event study? Okay. So often when we do a two-way defensive, the identification hypothesis is that there's what we call a prey trend. So you have their control group and treatment group, they behave the same way the prior to the treatment. And then there's a treatment. So I assume that this one is a good proxy for what will happen in this world, okay? So you can just put some dots and you will have expected the bike lane to be, you know, here plus alpha, okay? But then the bike lane actually turns out to be here. So then you can infer the difference from what we project in the, in the post-trend uh, has, um, has the causal effect. Okay. It's slightly easier if I can draw it, but if we don't have draw. Um, let me do that for a second. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting it wrong. Uh, no, 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 I'll just, I have, the, I, have, I have exactly the slide for that, slide it there, I'll... So here's what it looks like in a nutshell, if you want. So the hypothesis is that here's the control and here's the treatment. We assume that the, control, the treatment will have been approximately here plus alpha, if nothing had changed. And then what's happening is that it changed trend, and this is what we identify as the policies impact. Okay? Y'all follow what this is? So that's the proof of it. So the problem with that is, if the trend were not parallel before and they diverged, then this kind of means nothing. So I, what I've just shown you is a verification that this curve will actually parallel, which is very important when you do such analysis. So you can clearly see that this is the pre-treatment period and this is the post-treatment. So before the treatment, it was around zero. So these two curves were really parallel and the fixed effect were really capturing well the difference between the two. But once it hit the, the bike lane, massive difference. So there's two things that can explain it. Either um, 
this area was prone to an increase that is not explained by the data now, or uh, the treatment is, are the control kind of diverge from the working from one policy, which could be an issue. So this is for 500 meter, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. For the 500 meter, they increase by around that every year. You can see the upward trend. The other thing that I see is that BioClan exhibit network externality properties. So the thing you were asking to me is, how about you know the existing bike lane will then be cannibalized? So if so, then you will accept. Uh, here's Vachel, was a bike lane that already existed then got any improvement during the treatment period, and how did it change ridership? And what we find is there's around 20% ridership added. Okay. And my take is it's because it's connected now to the whole east-west. So if you live here, and it's really cool to have this added bike lane because now you can bike all of the year, in all of the year too, right? Which also intuitive because, you know, Bell the shell is half the increase of Belshaz, in St. Denis around 20% too. There. I just have a question because often when we have a like, notification in the street, like, of course, um, you're going to take the space from another vehicle, in this case, it's cars. So, did you see if the changes in parking might have affected this migration to the bicycle? Do you have an idea? Um, I, I did try, and what I was finding is a reduction of ish 5-10% of cars ridership. Yeah. Uh, which is quite notable. Yes. I don't have it in my slide because I'm not highly confident of the results so far. Because exactly this was not really good. So I, I was, it was really hard to argue that what I identified was indeed the bike lane or it's just a pre-trend existing. Because it's a really painful place to have a car. Um, they don't reduce parking, they reduce number of cars, throughput. Oh, okay. Okay. It's more like capacity. Yeah. No, Except on bell shafts. They did reduce it in bell shafts, but I don't think it's major. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what can explain this network functionality property? What I will look is speed and distance. Remember, I can know exactly the origin, destination, and the very time you check in and check out of the bike share. So I can know the distance you did linear distance, like by first flight, and I can know the speed you, are, you reach that distance. Okay. So with this element, I will look before and after the other bike lane for a specific area, and we'll see how it changes ridership. So for distance, what I look is, I will say, I will think of origin sensor track and destination sensor track fixed effect. I will say an average before the treatment have a fixed effect on this specific rest sensor track, this is the distance people use to perform from the sensor track or to the sensor track, okay? And I will do that for every sensor track, and now I will also look at after 2020. And what we'll fear is that there's around a 10% increase in distance after the other bike lane. Right. So, the other one, which is even more interesting, is speed. So, for specific origin and destination sensor struck, there's a specific distance. So what's the time people use to take for certain distances? Are people taking less time to make the same distance? That's what I'm looking at, so speed. And what we find is that if you look, you stay within Saint Denis, so within two sensor struck of Saint Denis, you will have around 6% increase. Sign for Ben Shaz, around seven. But if you go from Saint Denis to Belchas, so use two different bike lanes, then now you have a massive increase, slightly bigger. Uh, it's around 10%. Okay, it's around 50% more than the other. So it's clearly the, the added network increased a lot of the speed uh, between areas, which will explain the network's property. Could explain the network property of it. Okay. So the bike lane has network externality property, and the reason behind it is speed and distance are increased. Uh, so just making biking better. The data of collision are not yet out. They are going to be out in a month or so. So I will tell you, but it's quite obvious the collision has been, you know, it must be been safer. Uh, 
I'll just give this one. Now the thing is, as I've shown you, the parallel trend works. So there was not trend in the pre-trend, okay? As a reminder, here the pre-trend was good, and here I assumed that the parallel trend was still working. So I was making extrapolation of where, since I observed the control, I'm saying it's the control plus alpha. This should be where it is, but then the treatment is higher. So here's all inferior policies in fact. Okay, this is the idea of different. The problem of that is what if this one didn't stay parallel and instead went down by delta? Give you an example, one is more effective at working from one policy, so there's less bike ridership demand. Okay? That's a major issue. How can I fix that? Uh, I can trash the project. But I, I think a lot of people in transportation will have this issue. So here I'm going to propose what I think makes sense, and I want your critique on it. Uh, you can just say, you go, what the fuck are you doing? You're dumb. Or you can just say that makes sense. I'll be happy to hear your feedback on it. So what I'm saying is that the deviation from the pre-trend can be identified from something else that I don't, that I, that I observe. Okay? So that's, like, we don't know where is the true answer of this. The only thing we observe is the black line, but we want to reach to this line, okay? So in order to find the real beta. Currently, my hypothesis is I estimate a beta that is higher than the true impact of the bike lane. Why? Because maybe the treated, the control group is affected differently by the front from, from on policy than the control group. So my hypothesis to look at that is, um, let's look at winter ridership. Why? Because the control treatment are essentially still the same during winter, and the only thing that will really distinguish one another will be the working from home policy. So to that to be true, I make two really strong assumptions. Um, first, and you tell me if they're too strong. So the first hypothesis is, um, is that winter and summer behave the same way. When you compare two areas, the difference between these two areas during the summer and winter they're fairly similar. That's the hypothesis I'm making. I cannot verify this hypothesis. I, I, there's probably ways to verify that. But you can say that most of the time, these two are react will be very similar. And that what we'll capture with this delta will be, there's 5% less people that go to work during winter in this area. So let's assume that the demand system just reduced by 5%. The other thing I need to do is to assume that there's some proportionality between bike lane and subway. So that in certain way they're just similar to people. Um, are they similar? I don't know. Okay. Uh, and if I do that, you know, I take a, this is a control, this is a treatment group, and I fix the fact for every single day, and I look at the ridership of each subway station, and during the post-treatment here in the winter months, I find a five, six percent higher a relationship in the street dead area after 2020. That basically says um, the control group is five percent is six percent lower than the treated. Okay. So if that was zero problem would be solved, I would be like, great, you still have the same post trend. My indication is good. Now my conclusion is it's not perfect because clearly they seem to diverge for a small amount. And my take is what will be more intuitive is to take the 28% increase in ridership and make it minus the delta. So I, I find it something like 22%. So I'm not sure if this is valid, so don't take that as a cash. But I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think the apologists are not too stretch. I think it's reasonable to think people that bike are not fundamentally different than people that take a subway. Some end of tail difference, probably. Yes. Uh, It's not yet out, so it's hard to say. Uh, also, survey is also only in the fall. Mm -hmm. okay. right? I mean, it's every five years in the fall, so you cannot even test it. What I have, though, is I have, you know, I can test two areas that basically are almost identical. And, you know, I have the subway data of all Montreal, I have the bike lane of all Montreal. I could simulate the test to somewhere else to verify if this makes sense. Uh, it's kind of hard to you know if. Yeah, makes sense. 
there's so many explanations. So my, my take is uh, by clinic like, to increase ridership is something like 20%. That's my understanding of it. Um, because I think I overestimate when I do this one. And that's another way to do it. But this one is all known. The time. So that's it. Um, Yeah, no, I, th I think I'll, yeah. Are you interested in intermodality or no? I can make it in five minutes or no? I don't want to take more of your time. Okay, so thanks a lot for your time, everyone. It was fun to have you all. So thanks a lot. And uh, as I told you, I'll be really pleased to collaborate in any research idea and transportation. I'm sure a lot of input uh, an engineer can bring to an economist in transportation. So, have a good day.